Good afternoon. On behalf of the Marin Community College District's Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, and students, I am honored to welcome you to the College of Marin. I'm David Wayne Kuhn, Superintendent President. We are truly honored to be hosting today's town hall meeting with Congressman Jared Huffman along with Democratic House Leader Nancy Pelosi. We are joined today by our, our esteemed We are joined today by our, by our esteemed Board of Trustees, Brady Bevis, Diana Conti, please stand, Phil Cranenberg, Dr. Eva Long, Stephanie O'Brien, Stuart Tannenberg, and Wandine Trainer. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator of our town hall meeting. Dana King was a familiar face in the Bay Area for 15 years as a five-time Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist on the CBS 5 Eyewitness News. And she is a familiar face in Marin County, where she lived for 17 years before her recent move to Oakland. Dana has spent many years volunteering on behalf of children and youth, working to make early childhood education accessible for all students. Here in Marin County, Dana is the Founding Governance Leadership Chair for Marin Kids, an organization dedicated to improving access to education, housing, health care, and nutrition for youth. And she is also a founding member of the Marin Strong Start Coalition, a grassroots coalition which seeks to secure a stable source of funding to ensure access to quality health care, preschool, child care, and after school academic support for all Marin's children. Since moving to Oakland, Dana spends time volunteering every week at the Alameda County Juvenile Justice Center with young men in the maximum security units. Please join me in welcoming Dana King. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhn. It's so nice to be back in Marin. It's sunny and warm over here. Ooh. I heard a gasp when someone said, she's in Oakland. What? <laughs> I do miss Marin, and I was here for 15 years, and it will always, always be my home. My children were raised here and attended school here, and now they're grown, so when they flew the coop, I did too. But it's not that far, you're just over the bridge, I'm just over the bridge, come and visit us in Marin, we've got, in Marin, in Oakland, we have great restaurants, incredible art, I'm gonna do a little PR for Oakland. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out today. We have a very, very important program to discuss. Our agenda, to jumpstart the middle class. Shall we? Yes. 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 <laughs> and we are incredibly fortunate today to have our esteemed representatives in from Washington to talk about this crucial congressional plan. Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, Congressman Jared Hoffman. So we're going to hear from Congressman Hoffman in just a moment. He's going to give us a thumbnail sketch of the Jumpstart Action Plan. Then we'll hear from students who will share their personal stories. President Wayne Boone and Dr. Watton Paul will follow and share their work in the field on college access and affordability and the importance of preschool, as well as the need for childcare, because without which many families cannot afford to send their children to preschool. And then we're gonna take your questions. And I know it's rare to have this power base at this table in front of you, and many things I'm sure you wanna discuss, but we, we do wanna stay on topic. So we're gonna go through the questions and make sure we do that. Um, so we'll be passing, uh, Congressman Huffman's staff has paper and pencils. If you have questions, then um, they'll be passed up to me. And when you're done writing on them, just raise your hand and we'll pick them up. All right? So, shall we get started? Yeah. All right. I want to introduce Congressman Huffman. You know him, you see him all the time. He's an incredibly hard worker. But first and foremost, Jared Huffman is a dad. He is a father of two children, and he's married to a wonderful woman who is a public school teacher. For Jared, public education is of paramount importance. He values it as a necessary ingredient for a vibrant society, 
and our economy, and he values it personally for his children and their future success. Representative Huffman was sworn in as a member of the 113th Congress on January 3rd, 2013. He represents our second district. The district spans from the Golden Gate Bridge north to the Oregon border, and it covers six counties, including all of Marin, Mendocino, Humboldt, Trinity, and Del Norte, and much of Sonoma counties. Congressman Huffman is a member of the Committee on Natural Resources and the House Budget Committee. In Congress, as in the Assembly, Mr. Huffman has distinguished himself as a legislator who tackles complex public policy challenges. He works tirelessly and he gets results, often by forging bipartisan consensus on very difficult issues. You all read the news, right? You know, bipartisanship is hard to come by, but that's what Congressman Huffman does on your behalf. Jared is a father, a husband, a member of our community, and a leader in Congress. I'm very honored to call him my friend and your friend. So we welcome him back. Well, thank you, Dana King, for that great introduction. And thanks for everything that you have done for not only Marin, but for the whole Bay Area as a broadcaster, as a community leader. And I know I'm not just supposed to say this, but we hope you're going to do even more as a member of the Oakland City Council soon. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of the students, the guests, the dignitaries, uh, certainly the College of Marin for hosting this important discussion today. And of course, I want to thank my colleague, our great Democratic leader, Nancy Pelosi, for giving us some, some real quality time uh, in a schedule that you would just not believe. Uh, the fact that she has chosen to spend this time with us is a real honor and a privilege. Um, and as great as it is uh, for me to be here at the College of Marin today, I have to tell you honestly, uh, I'd rather be back in session in Congress right now. Uh, I'd rather be working on the mountain of unfinished work that this Congress should be doing right now. Some of you may know that Many of us in the House of Representatives uh, wrote to Speaker Boehner. We urged him to keep Congress in session to address a number of critical priorities, including passing something President Obama has requested, a critical supplemental funding bill to address the humanitarian crisis we face at the border. The President has also requested critical supplemental funding to support federal agencies who are trying to fight wildfires throughout the West in this critical drought year. And while we're at it, if we were uh, working like we should be in this Congress, uh, we could have votes on bipartisan bills to raise the minimum wage, to provide long-term unemployment assistance to job seekers. We could reauthorize the Export-Import Bank to support American small businesses and manufacturers without any cost to the taxpayers. We could pass a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform that passed the Senate. We could bring up a bipartisan common sense background check law so that we can better protect our college campuses, our schools, our communities from these acts of gun violence that have become all too common in our country. But since Speaker Boehner declined our request to stay in session and work on those things, uh, I'm still happy to make the most of this opportunity to be in the district. You know my district covers the whole North Coast, so I've spent the last few uh, weeks in places like Trinity County, working with firefighters on the fire lines and our forest lands, I've met with agricultural leaders in Humboldt County, broadband advocates just yesterday in Mendocino County, and a community health clinic in Sonoma County, and a lot more. And of course today, I have the great opportunity to be with all of you here at College of Marin to talk about another very critical priority, and that is ensuring high quality, affordable education for everyone in America. Such an honor to have Leader Pelosi here at College of Marin, you will not find a more passionate advocate for education and for the middle class than Leader Pelosi. In fact, she is the architect of this thing you'll be hearing from, House Democrats' middle class jumpstart agenda. And what it is is a hundred day plan to revitalize our struggling middle class. And, and what she brings to it um, is kind of relevant to where we are at this time. You know, we've got the back to school energy here on the campus of the College of Marin, and Leader Pelosi's been in Congress a long time, but she still manages to bring that back to school energy to her job 
every single day in all of her work on behalf of the middle class. So I'm so proud of her leadership. Uh, three months ago, I had the honor of addressing the College of Marin uh, graduating class at their commencement here on campus. And I was struck by two things. The first thing was this palpable sense of pride and accomplishment and optimism that you get from graduates and their families. And if anybody wants to understand what education means to people's lives, just come to a community college commencement and look around. You will get it instantly. The other thing that struck me, though, was the graduates' incredible personal stories. And they were stories of hard work, grit, and determination. Now, College of Marin, of course, takes pride in famous alumni, like uh, the great Robin Williams, who tragically uh, we lost last week. But I think the college uh, can and does and should take equal pride in the diverse group of graduates that I met a few months ago at the commencement, including the mother of three kids who was living on public assistance while working her way through school. And this young mother, uh, after several years of hard work and coming through to get her credential at College of Marin, will be entering UC Berkeley in just a few days to study sociology. There was a young man I met who came to America from Taiwan at age 16, didn't speak a word of English, didn't have his parents with him, and he worked so hard not only to learn a new language, but to get good grades and lift himself up through education that he not only made it through College of Marin, but he will be starting San Jose State in a few days to study mechanical engineering. And there were so many stories like that. And there are stories not only at College of Marin, but all over this country about how education transforms lives, and families, and communities. And when you think about it, and when I think about my own experience graduating college and law school with what I thought was significant student debt, although by today's standards it almost seems trivial, uh, we absolutely just have to do much more. If we want a vibrant and healthy economy, if we want young people to keep reaching up and pursuing higher education and everything it can do for them and for their communities and for our country and our economy, then we have to do more to make sure graduates can enter the workforce without crippling levels of student debt. Now here in Marin, we are fortunate to have some terrific community partners and foundations that are working to help students gain access to college and graduate without that kind of debt. Folks like the Next Generation Scholars, 10,000 Degrees, and the Marin Community Foundation. But we have to do much more, and specifically, we need Congress to do more. And that's why I'm so happy to be here with Leader Pelosi to talk about our middle class jumpstart plan. The plan, as I mentioned, a 100-day plan for what we would do to uh, to turn the middle class around, it includes education in a very big way. But it's, it's a straightforward list of priorities that I think everyone really should support. It includes tax breaks for creating jobs instead of shipping them overseas. It includes uh, a priority of building America's infrastructure, raising the minimum wage, giving America a raise, focusing on supporting women and families through paycheck fairness, paid sick leave and affordable child care. And critical to the plan is our education agenda. Affordable education to keep America number one is how we, how we frame it. And specifically, we think there's a lot to do to improve the bookends of our K through 12 education system. Uh, college affordability on one end and early childhood education on the other. So I am working with Leader Pelosi and other House Democrats to pass a bill that we call Bank on Students Emergency Loan Refinancing Act. This will just let folks refinance their college loans at today's historically low interest rates. We're doing more than that, though. We're working to advance President Obama's call for universal early childhood education by passing a bill we call Strong Start for America's Children. We know that children who don't attend preschool are often behind once they reach kindergarten, and some of them, many of them, never catch up. So uh, that's just not acceptable in America in the 21st century. We know that for many families, child care is an important prerequisite to preschool attendance. And by the way, child care, affordable child care, is also a prerequisite for economic survival for a lot of working families. So we have to include affordable child care when we talk about our preschool initiatives. And consider the fact that even here in Marin County, one of the most affluent counties in the United States, one out of every four children does not attend preschool. Only 32% of Latino three and four year old children attend preschool. And by the third grade, 65% of economically disadvantaged children do not read at grade level. 
here in Marin County. So we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, it's going to take federal, state, and local leadership to address these gaps and to realize our broader vision of a high-quality, affordable education system from pre-K to higher education that works for everyone in this country. We've got a terrific program here today. I'm looking forward to hearing from the other speakers, and I thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Congressman Hoffman. The work that you do helps build our foundation, and it starts with education. It starts with pre-K. When a child doesn't go to pre-K, and compared to a child that does, the one that goes to pre-K is 18 months ahead of the child that doesn't, and they never catch up. So I'm looking forward to seeing that bill signed and the work begun. But we're talking about college right now and uh, the affordability of it, or sometimes the lack of affordability of college and how difficult it sometimes can be to keep a job, go to school, get good grades, eat well, and have a life. I'd like to bring to the stage Catalea Sankum. She entered College of Marin just this spring after attending City College of San Francisco and the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Ms. Sankum transferred to Calm in order to save money and continue her education without having to take time off from college. She's majoring in international studies and currently serves as a student ambassador as an ambassador, Ms. Sankum focuses on helping students better understand the true costs of college so that they can make informed decisions. Catalea Sankum. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for being here. I'm glad to share my story so that other students will be more aware and can make better decisions about college. After high school, I first attended City College of San Francisco, and then I transferred to the Fashion Institute of Technology, not, really, not realizing how expensive it was going to be. And that's where I learned the true cost of college. My parents, unfortunately, as living as they were, could not afford to help me. So I had to take out loans within the first year and then ended up coming back to California not too long afterwards when I realized how much debt I've already accumulated. Now attending College of Marin, I'm trying to work and, stab and stabilize my financial situation, but I'm a much more reasonable cost and with a very supportive community. My advice to other students would be to do your homework on different co college options like community colleges, public and private universities, <coughs> what you might qualify for in terms of financial aid, and also to really dig into scholarships. I don't regret my college experience so far, but at the same time, I also wish that I wasn't 22 years old with $15,000 in debt. The time and energy to research different college options can really pay off, and then you'll be able to make more informed decisions that will make college less stressful and more enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catalea. $15,000 in debt. And that spirals into the economy because if a student comes out of school with huge debt, that means they can't buy cars, they can't buy furniture, they can't start their lives. So we really have to work on this. I'd now like to bring to the stage uh, a young man who is originally from Los Angeles. Lance Reyes enrolled at the College of Marin as a re entry student in 2010. During his time here at Com, he was active in the Puente program, Latino Student Union, and served as Associated Student President, Youth Leadership Institute Mentor, Peer Tutor, and Student Trustee. Mr. Reyes spent much of his time advocating on behalf of students. He focused on creating projects that increase access to educational opportunities with special attention to the unique needs of Com students and supporting student success both academically and socially. Mr. Reyes majored in electronic or electrical engineering and computer sciences, and he transferred to UC Berkeley this fall.
Congressman Huffman, special guest, Congresswoman Pelosi, I want to thank you for being here today. And I want to thank you for your continued service and receptiveness for the American people and uh, for American students. My story is, is one that strays from a, a traditional path. Uh, I didn't go to college straight out of high school. I actually uh, never felt like college was for me. Uh, I went into, uh, the, the, I went to uh, look for a job, and I ended up in, a, in an apprenticeship program, an uh, electrical apprenticeship program, where I learned the trade, uh, electrical trade. And I think that there was a part of it, that component that had a night class. And, and through that night class, I gained the confidence, and I gained the, 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 the strive to want to do more. And I, that was the genesis, and that was the spark that brought me uh, to school, that brought me back to school. So when I, when I was looking for, for how I would go about this, I, I, wanted, I definitely wanted to, to look for a place that, that had smaller classes. Um, I needed something that made sense for me, and what made sense for me was community college. Smaller classes, uh, personalized attention. There was also affordability, and that was a huge factor for me. Because a, a lot, I didn't have a lot of means to, to go to a, a university straight out of college. So I came to College of Brent, and I enjoyed every minute of it. But it wasn't easy. I, there was a lot of times where we had to think, I had to think about um, where the cost of education doesn't stop at tuition. There's books, there's supplies, there's housing, there's transportation. There's so many other things that happen through the course of your life that, you know, something that happens at the most unopportune time you have to fix a, you know, an AC problem or something like that. And, and so I, I had to look for resources, uh, one of those being uh, the Pell Grant. So, it, like I said, it, it wasn't easy, and, and my story doesn't differ from a lot of other students. There's a lot of students that, that are in similar situations, maybe even worse. What, what, what made the difference for me was being able to, to come to a place that I knew was affordable, that I knew had the resources that were there so that I could get my education. Now, many of our students face a lot of obstacles, and there's students that face even another obstacle where they worry about their legal status, about their, whether they're gonna be deported. I think that has another psychological effect that, that most students don't, aren't aware of, but should be. So I ask that you, that you both continue to support legislation that not just, not just opens the door, but expands the door. For many students like myself, that never felt that they had an opportunity, but are now reaching their dream school. Thank you. is how much of a struggle does it have to be? That's what we're working on here. Well, he introduced me, so I get the opportunity to now introduce College of Marin Superintendent and President, David Wayne Coon. He began his tenure here in 2010, in December. Throughout a 25-year career in higher education, Dr. Coon has been recognized for his leadership locally, regionally, and nationally. He came to Marin following a successful five-year stint as president of Evergreen Valley College in San Jose, where he championed a richly diverse student body. Prior to Evergreen Valley College, Dr. Kuhn held a variety of administrative positions in the Washington State Community College system. Dr. Kuhn has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communications and Public Relations from Central Washington University a Master's of Education in Student Personnel Administration from Western Washington University, and a Doctorate of Education in Educational Leadership with emphasis in Organizational Development from Seattle University. <clears throat> Dr. Kuhn was presented with the 2006 Special Achievement Award by the Central Washington University Alumni Association. And in May of 2007, Central Washington University dedicated the David Wayne Coon Center for Excellence in Leadership. Aren't we fortunate? Dr. Wayne Coon has taken great pride in helping shape the center in a manner consistent with his own sense of humility, integrity, and commitment to service. Dr. Wayne Coon. Thank you again for that kind introduction. 
You know, it, it occurs to me that in the beginning of our program, I asked you to acknowledge the leadership of our school districts, and it really occurs to me that the folks that really impact the lives of these young students on our stage are our teachers. So if you're a retired or current teacher, please stand so we can acknowledge all the great work that you've done. So I'd like to provide some context for our conversation today by sharing some information about college affordability, i.e. financial aid, and College of Marin's Early Childhood Education Teacher Training Program. With respect to financial aid, despite the relative wealth in Marin County, 50% of our 7,500 uh, students, those credit students, receive financial aid. That's 50%. 50, 50 the average annual award per student is just under $5,600. This includes a combination of fee waivers, grants, loans, and scholarships. Now on the bright side, this year, we anticipate awarding over $150,000 in scholarships. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the number of students who attend community colleges receiving financial aid increased from 61% in 2006-2007 to over 74% in 2010-2011. Another troubling statistic provided by the National Center pertains to the rising default rates for student loans. The center recently reported the three-year community college default rate at 21% nationwide. That's one in five. And it's projected that this rate will increase in the coming years. So one question to consider, if community college students still borrow less than their counterparts at four-year colleges and universities, why are they increasingly defaulting at such higher rates? One of the answers to this question is that many community college students, like the two we've heard from, transfer in from other institutions where they have already accumulated a large amount of debt. So in essence, they're starting out with their heads underwater. To help put this in context here at the College of Marin, the average age of our students in our credit program is 34, and over 22% of our students have previously earned a bachelor's degree or higher. So not surprisingly, one of the major factors contributing to student default rates has been the poor economy in the recent past. Many stu students had no other choice than to borrow, and borrow more. Initially, some students relied upon loans to supplement lost income, and most continue to rely upon loans to help cover living expenses while they're pursuing their education. Unfortunately for students, there's no way to get out from underneath the student loan. Unlike every other debt, it cannot be forgiven, nor can it be included in a bankruptcy. The bigger issue is that the interest on a student loan continues to grow whether a student is in default or not. So that mountain just keeps getting bigger. So while the overall amount of debt students accumulate is the greatest concern, financial planning, or lack thereof, is also a significant factor in the problem. This is why colleges, including College of Marin, are placing increased emphasis on financial literacy and early financial aid counseling. So with regard to early childhood education, for more than four decades, the California community colleges have been the primary higher education system responsible for early childhood teacher preparation. It is estimated that annually more than 100,000 California Community College students are enrolled in early childhood education programs, and more than 10,000 student parents are serving campus children's centers. Early, ch early childhood education programs are among the top enrolled disciplines in the California Community College system. The College of Marin is the only accredited educational institution in Marin County that trains Marin's early childhood educators. Located on both of our campuses are California State Preschools that provide subsidized preschool to low-income students, excuse me, just, that provide subsidized preschool to low-income families from around the county. The Child Study Center classrooms are early childhood education lab schools that provide model learning environments that demonstrate the best practices that are taught in our ECE courses. The Child Study Centers provide the primary venue for the college's ECE students to complete the student teaching practicum that is required for an associate's degree in early childhood education. I thank you for the opportunity to talk a bit about college affordability and the early childhood education curriculum.
very hopeful to hear that there's $150,000 in scholarship money for students here at uh, College of Marin. That's awesome. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Michael Wattenpaw. He is the superintendent of the San Rafael City Schools, a highly diverse K through 12 district in the San Francisco Bay Area. During his 30 year career in public education, he has worked as a classroom teacher, assistant principal, elementary school principal, middle school principal, and assistant superintendent. In 2005, he was named Sonoma County Superintendent of the Year during his tenure as superintendent for the Katani Ronan Park Unified School District. Since his appointment here in 2007, he has led district and community initiatives to create and ensure equity-based educational opportunities and support for every single student. Every school and all significant subgroups continue to report gains in student achievement in his district. Under his tenure, the district now receives over $1.5 million in annual grant funding to support closing the achievement gap, ensuring a quality education for every child. He has built new partnerships and collaborations with local and national foundations and nonprofit organizations. The district is engaged in a multi-year collaboration with a national equity project to create an equity-based, culturally proficient learning organization. Dr. Michael Wattenpaul. Thank you. As Dana mentioned, I'm the superintendent of San Rafael City Schools, which is just north of here. And we're actually two school districts, the San Rafael Elementary District and the San Rafael City High School Districts with a common board and a common administration. We currently operate 13 schools with nearly 7,000 students. Our student enrollment has consistently grown over the last several years. We've added 1,200 of those students in the last five years, and we're projected to grow by another 3,000 in the next several years. But our district is the most diverse district in all of Marin County. 60% of our students are Latino. 60% of our students participate in the free and reduced lunch program. 55% of our students are English learners. And for purposes of the new state local control accountability plan, 65% of students are an unduplicated count of either free and reduced lunch students, English learners, or foster youth. So here we are in the middle of Marin County, the wealthiest county in the nation, and it's hard to believe that the demographics of a school district in Marin are the demographics of San Rafael City Schools. <clears throat> day after tomorrow, Thursday, is the first day of school. And about 50% of our entering class of kindergartners, about 650 of them, will have been to preschool. We don't know what kind of preschool, we don't know if it's a quality preschool, but they've been to some kind of a preschool experience. The other 50% have not. For those children who have not attended preschool, they've been exposed to 350,000 less words than a child that's attended preschool. They enter school with noticeable delays, many unable to access the kindergarten curriculum, particularly that of the Common Core, which we're implementing, which is a college career readiness curriculum that does begin in kindergarten. Our staff is committed to doing whatever it takes to move these children forward. It's a Herculean effort, but our staff arrives every single day with the intent of having those students that they serve be college and career ready, starting in kindergarten. We also support families who are uncertain how to necessarily support their own children in getting onto that pathway for college. Because it really does begin early. It doesn't begin just in your ninth grade year in high school. We know from our experiences that these early childhood years pave the way for college. In the next few days at the end of the week, I will go to every single kindergarten class and I will ask the question, who's going to college? Every single student will raise their hand. They know that it's something to aspire to. They know that it's something good that they should want to do. By the time they reach second grade, 
I'll do a follow-up question and ask them, what are they going to do after they finish college? So I get answers like a veterinarian, a doctor. This last year, a second grader told me, I have a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> and so her first choice was veterinarian, and her backup plan is to be a singer. So I told her, keep going. <laughs> So regardless of the college or career pathways that our children choose, entering kindergarten ready to learn sets the stage for college and career readiness. The importance of preschool cannot be understated. Public school districts like San Rafael City Schools must work in partnership with our zero to five partners, those that serve children from the age of zero to five, because they help us get kindergarten children ready to start school. At the same time, we must engage the entire school community in helping to collaborate and work with us so that all students or more students arrive ready to learn. We must create welcoming school environments where every family feels welcome, that they see a place for themselves at that particular school site, and have them be partners in kindergarten all the way through the time their children leave for college. In San Rafael City Schools, we know that 70% of our high school graduates begin college immediately after graduation. About 60% of those go back for a second year. But after a six year period, it's only 30% that graduate with a bachelor's degree. We don't necessarily know exactly what the reason is, but we know that it's not the recession. We know that it's not tuition costs because for San Rafael City Schools, that's a 10-year trend. We're just above the state and national average, and we know that we can do better. If we align all of our resources, both fiscal and human, we can come together as one community that guarantees that we develop an educated community, that middle class piece. It's my district, the community college, the regional partners, the state and federal governments, all coming together to ensure that we educate and graduate the next generation of college graduates. In San Rafael City Schools, our motto is lifting student achievement, every student, every day, which we do. And they're calling in right now because they're ready. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much. Let's get them through college, all four years and then beyond that, right? So day after tomorrow, you're gonna have a whole bunch of shiny new pennies. Okay. Everyone excited, <clears throat> joy. Okay. It's now my honor to bring to the podium the Democratic leader of the U.S. House of Representatives for the 113th Congress, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi. In 2011, Mrs. Pelosi served as Speaker of the House, the first woman to do so in American history. In October of 2013, she was inducted into the National Woman's Hall of Fame at a ceremony in Seneca Falls, which is the birthplace of the American Women's Rights Movement. For 27 years, Leader Pelosi has represented San Francisco, the 12th district in Congress. She has led House Democrats for a decade and previously served as the House Democratic Whip. I learned a lot about that on House of Cards. <laughs> She's tough. Under the leadership of Ms. Pelosi, the 111th Congress was heralded as one of the most productive Congresses in history by Congressional Scholar Norman Ornstein. Ms. Pelosi spearheaded passage of historic health insurance reform legislation in the House, which establishes a patient's bill of rights and will provide insurance for tens of millions more Americans while lowering health care costs over the long term. She also led the Congress in passing the Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act, which expands educational opportunities 
and reforms the financial aid system to save billions of taxpayer dollars. Leader Pelosi comes from a strong family tradition of public service out of Baltimore, Maryland. She is married to Paul Pelosi, and she is the mother of five and the grandmother of nine. Ladies and gentlemen, the leader of the house. Honor to be here with each and every one of you, certainly with my colleague Jared Hoffman. Thank you all very much for sending him to Congress. With President Kuhn, uh, congratulations on the recognition you have received and the great leadership you are providing. Uh, with Michael Wattenpah, thank you for the leadership. We're thrilled to be going to all of those kindergartens and talking to those children. How lovely. Lance and uh, Katlea, thank you. You're our VIPs of the day, telling us your stories. You are the future, and we learn from you. And Dana, good luck to you and everything that you are pursuing. And thank you for being back with us today in Marin County and sharing the pride you take in your association with Marin, at the College of Marin. Uh, I'm honored to be here. It was mentioned earlier that Robin Williams attended this school, and I want to say thank you for contributing to his magic. You know, when uh, I was reading when Mozart, the, like the 250th anniversary of the birthday of Mozart, which was about a dozen years ago, and when they talked about Mozart, they said people would call him a genius, but a genius is someone that if we watched what they did, we could learn how they do it if we work very, very hard and we were very, very smart. But Mozart was not just a genius. He was a magician because he had ever repeated uh, 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 examples of excellence. And that's how I think of Robin Williams. More than a genius, a magician who could constantly be entrepreneurial with fresh new ways. It's impossible to be like him because he was the only one. And thank you, College of Marin, for contributing to his magic, which contributes to the joy of our country. In acknowledging your great member of Congress, Jared Hoffman, I want to also acknowledge his predecessor in Congress, Congresswoman Lynn Wolsey, who was a champion for education in the Congress. Uh, she had opportunities to lead the education committee, to go to appropriations and other coveted positions, and she said, I'm just not leaving the children. And she, she, her legacy is a great one there, working with Congressman George Miller, the chairman of the committee from across the bay. Uh, she's so happy that Jared Hoffman is following, not necessarily in her footsteps, because he is making his own path. Uh, but for carrying the banner of public education in such a very strong way, personally with his two children, Sophia and Nathan, but also officially in the Congress of the United States. Everything to do with children and their future, whether it's the air they breathe and protecting the environment, whether it's budget priorities and when she serves, the when it serves on the budget committee in terms of uh, establishing the priorities that are right for our country, who better than Jared Hoffman with his values and his understanding, coming from the legislature, effective from the start, one of the leaders in Congress already, only there a matter of months, not years yet, a uh, recognized leader in preserving our planet, protecting our environment, and uh, doing all of it for our children's future. Thank you. Jarrett went through a long list of pieces of legislation that if we were in session, we could pass. They have bipartisan support, whether it's immigration, uh, gun violence, uh, reducing gun violence, whether it's Voting Rights Act. He, he named a long list, I won't repeat it, except to say, to associate myself with the concern that he put, these are bipartisan pieces of legislation that have the votes to pass, which are not passing. And we have to take the message out to the public to say, let's have this drumbeat across America to say, let's be bipartisan, let's get the job done. President Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. And to the extent that you help us get this message across about education and jump-starting the middle class, rather than stalling the middle class, oh, I found it here, 
Installing the middle class really helps, and that's why today, for me, is so important for us, Jared and I, something we will report back to our colleagues on. As he said, it's three pieces. It's about jobs and growth. Make it in America, increase our manufacturing base by having tax credits to keep jobs here, good paying jobs here, and building the infrastructure of America. It's about a part of the matter. When women succeed, America succeeds, giving women uh, equal pay for equal work, raising the minimum wage, uh, uh, paid sick leave, just a really big issue for women and men in our country, and then the issue of quality, affordable child care. Children learning, parents earning, which segues into our education piece. It's part of the women's piece, it's a part of keeping America number one piece, it's part of lifetime learning. Now let's just establish a couple things. Because when we had this debate with our colleagues, and Jared knows this firsthand on the budget committee, they would say, oh, we can't do that, it's going to increase the deficit. There is nothing that we can do in public policy that brings more money to the Treasury and therefore reduces the deficit more than investing in public education. whether it's K through 12, whether it's higher education, postgrad, lifetime learning, which was, comes back to the community college, all of it reduces the deficit. So if somebody says, well, we have to cut Pell Grants because or we can't rate, increase the amount for Pell Grants because it's going to increase the deficit, or we cannot uh, get rid of these high interest rates for kids because that helps reduce the deficit, that's totally wrong. In fact, it's not smart. And what we want to be about education is smart because it is fundamental to our democracy. It is fundamental to our middle class and those who aspire to it. So this is, uh, this today, what we're doing, investing in education to keep America number one. It's not just about individuals, although that would be justification helping people reach their aspirations, be it veterinarian or singer, or both, who knows? All your passion, right? Like, and, and, uh, or whether it, it's just about keeping our economy, number one. We think an important part of that is increasing the, uh, unleashing the power of women in the economy with some of the things that talk, we talked about, child, early childhood education and, and the rest. But you can't unleash the power of women unless we have education. And that is the key to everything. So I'm very proud, and I accept the kind words of Dana, on, uh, except on behalf of my colleagues in the Congress, the Democratic side who made all of that possible. And also to say, just to list, we help the students afford a, uh, a higher education with increasing the Pell Grant. The fight we're having right now is it was 4,000, frozen at that. We raised it to 55.50 with, with uh, indexing to make it higher. The cost goes up, go up. Right now, our colleagues want to freeze the amount for 10 years. It just doesn't make sense. So that's one of the values debates. I don't even call these issues. These are values debates. The education of the American people. Assisting graduates pay, to pay back their loans. Uh, th this is essential, and as, as Jared said, at a lower, in refinance it at the low interest rate. We had the bill to do it. We've done it before. It expired now uh, since we lost the majority. Now we want to do that again. Investing in ed educational, edu whether it's the GI Bill for the 21st century, are, you, are returning veterans coming back and going to school, many of them in community colleges, and what I learned as I visit community colleges across the country, which are the, the bridge, which are the bridge. They are the threshold that take people, whether it's into uh, occupation or a, a, to another institution of higher learning. The, the, these uh, veterans in school, some of them very young, some of them not so young, all of them a valuable asset uh, to the classroom. Uh, that's what the kids tell me, who are not veterans. And also, whether it's historically black colleges, minority serving institutions, whether Hispanic or the Native American or the rest. And then, as, as was mentioned uh, um, earlier by Katlea, uh, helping kids shop for the best deal 
for them. It's really important to have that happen and then helping them transition to employment and nobody does that better than our community colleges. So this is, this is central. I always say to people who are, who are at this place with kids who are making it through high school, transitioning to community colleges, this is the most important job in the world, in our country. That transition to make sure kids get to that place. And having spoken at uh, commencements at community colleges, I always say, you know, people brag about their child graduating from here, there, and there. These are the success stories. These are our victories of these kids. Some of them having to support their own families, their parents. Some of them having to support their own families if they are married with children. Imagine the challenge that they have. Imagine the optimism that they have about the future. So we're very, very excited about it. And the fact is, as has been indicated, this all begins at a very young age, from zero. You mentioned Mike, from zero, if I may, Mr. Superintendent. Uh -huh. From zero to five years old, it's really important. As a more in the country, and we've had events, uh, what, what we're doing now is we have the middle class jump start. Instead of the stall, we have the jump start. Jobs, education, when women succeed. So this is our education week, and I couldn't be more honored to be here. These events are occurring across the country. But earlier on, when we were asking women, what would help you the most to, uh, to unleash your uh, power in the workplace and, and have the balance between home and work, we would go around and listen to people's stories. And one story that I'll close with, because it goes to these young children, is um, a woman came and she was going to tell her story. And when she got up, she said, I, you know, mother of five, English second language, single mom, you, you name it, she had it all. Right? And she now, she said, she had every challenge. She said, I am, um, uh, now I'm confident, I just got a promotion at work, you know, I went to community college, a promotion at work, but I was nervous speaking in front of all these women at one of a meeting such as this. So she said, I said to my kids, Will you listen to mommy's speech so that, because I, I, I'm nervous about tomorrow, maybe you could give me some comments about it. So we lined up her five kids, the youngest being four, in Head Start. And she said, uh, she gave a speech, and at the end she said, does anybody have any comments or questions? Four-year-old raised her hand in Head Start and said, I just have one question, Mom. Who gave you permission to use my name in your speech? <laughs> <laughs> you go, girl. And that is the confidence, the self-esteem. So it's, all, it's about knowledge, it's about vocabulary, it's about socialization, it's about so much that makes a person have the uh, confidence uh, to go forward. So thank all of you for what you do. When the teachers stood up, I thought how indebted we are uh, to all of you and to all of you and to the trustees and the rest for what you do. It's about the middle class, the backbone of our democracy, Nothing supports a democracy more than an informed population. So thank you for your patriotism. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership, Nancy Pelosi, all these years, recognizing that investing in our students is what makes America great. And this is a great nation. I have a bunch of questions. They're not mine. For once, I'm retired from that question answering phase of my life. So thank you for your questions. And um, I'm going to. Oh, here's some more. And a timer. Just keep coming. Let's keep coming. I'm going to start with a question. And how much time do we have for this round? Do we, someone want to let me know? Jenny, are you here? Thank you. We can, sorry, the leader says we can go longer. We want to honor everyone's time, but when leader Nancy Pelosi says we can go longer, we're going longer. With your pencils. <laughs> We're going to start with a question from Maha Ziani. And Maha asks, 
How will you plan to help the families who do not qualify for public assistance with child care and realis realistic costs here in Lane County? How can a single parent in school be expected to decide between food or a $300 book? Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll take a start at it. And the Thank reason I, I asserted myself in terms of the time is because I was a little late getting here, so maybe we can put 10 minutes on the end. Here's the thing, that's why our uh, jumpstart has a oneness to it. What we really have to do is give everyone in America a raise. We have to increase the minimum wage. You may not, you may not make the minimum wage, but giving, every, uh, lifting the minimum wage, we did it in the first 100 hours when we had the, uh, the house, but now it's time to do it again. That was 2007. It's time to do it again. So we must raise the minimum wage so that if you raise the minimum wage, you take mil like four million women off of food stamps. You lift maybe six million people out of poverty. Now, that's still not a lot of money when we're talking about $10.10, where we want to go. But it's a big jump from where we are now, A. B, we have to have, and, and, and we have several pieces of the early childhood education, because it's about children learning, parents earning. It's not just about the children watching TV or something, it's about them learning. And so the parents uh, can, look, let me tell you this other story, and this sounds like what you, this woman was supposed to tell her story, she was a bus driver, and she had the same thing, single mom, kids, this, 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 and she worked herself up, she got a job as a bus driver. And so she came to tell her story, and she said, I'm not gonna tell you my story, I'm going to tell you the story of what I see as a school bus driver. My bus pulls up to the curb, and I'll see a mom there crying, tears in her eyes, and I know what's going to happen. She's going to put a sick child on the bus because she has absolutely no choice. She doesn't make enough money to say, well, I'll take a day off and be docked the pay. She can't afford that, and if she does it too often, she doesn't have a job. She has not one day of paid sick leave, not one day, and there are millions of people in the country in this category, mostly women that we're describing, not one day of paid sick leave, and absolutely no way to pay for childcare. So she has no option but to put a sick child on the bus, which isn't good for that child, or anyone else on the bus. If it's a cold, if it's a stomach, you can just imagine on the bus or at school. How could it be, you talked about Marin County being this wealthy county and still and all, we have kids with lots of needs here. How could it be in the greatest country that ever existed in the face of the earth, with all the enlightenment that we have, that we would have a situation where mom has to put a sick child on the bus because she has absolutely no recourse. So for that person's question, increase pay. It's a big deal. Money means a lot. I mean, let's face it. More money in the pocket of that mom. On the, board, on the uh, child care, we have several things. The president has universal pre-K. That's like fourth grade, I mean, pre-kindergarten. But we have to go down lower. So we have to have increased tax credits and the rest uh, for uh, uh, families to take advantage, whether it's at the federal level or the state level. And we have to, again, have uh, what we worked on when Lynn was there and, and that Jared uh, worked on at the state level, because California has led the way, and Jared did this in the state legislature, is to have paid sick leave, uh, especially maternity leave in California. California has led the way, thank you, Jared Hoffman. But here's the thing, we, I was there when we passed the bill, uh, the um, family medical leave. President Clinton signed the bill. A hundred million times America's families have taken advantage of it. But for tens of millions of families, they had no paid. It wasn't paid and it, you just can't afford it. California has led the way on the paid. It's a 10 year anniversary now of paid, the, that uh, initiative in California leading the way. So all of these things that are pieces of something that we know is the economic stability of a family, whether it's relating to health, 
whether it's relating to wages, whether it's relating to childcare, whatever it is, to lift these families up, in this case a woman, so that she can unleash her power uh, in the workplace. And this isn't just a title, When Women Succeed, America Succeeds. It's not just, a, it's a good title. It tests very favorably in all the polling and at focus groups, but it's an absolute fact. When women succeed, America succeeds. So this is about that woman, her family, and the greatness of our country, so that we are not a country that has to hold our head down and say, put the sick child on the bus. That's the triple down that we have in mind for you. Thank you. Briefly, as a, as a postscript, um, the College of Marin has a variety of programs that are intentionally focused for students over who are low income, first generation, students with disabilities. And two programs in particular that I could think of that may be of assistance to this particular student would be either the EOPS program or Single Stop. So I encourage the student with a question to stop by Student Services, and uh, anybody in that building can help you get to one of those two programs. And actually, I see the Single Stop coordinator in the back row right here. She may be, Tara may be able to help you. Uh, the individual with the question, so thank you. I also say that in the IDEA category of children with disabilities, he's our hero in Congress. <laughs> he's our hero in Congress. Jared Hoffman is really leading the way in that. Thank you, Jessica. The next question I have, you know, Catalea mentioned that she has $15,000 in, in debt um, at the age of 22 and is working to pay it off. and. Um, my first question is, are you worried about that, Catalea, increasing the debt? And the question from the audience, or the panel as well, is student loans. What can you do to help former students whose student loans have fallen into default due to the poor economy during this economic downturn? So Catalea, do you worry about increasing that amount? Of course. I'm always worried about it. Um, sometimes I have nightmares about it, which I shouldn't, um, but you know, it is something that I'm trying to put a dollar in a piggy bank every day just to make sure I can at least put $50 towards that, or at least towards the interest that's accumulating. But it's definitely something that's worrying me, and I hope to get through it as soon as I can. I just want to say that loan forgiveness is one part of how we need to respond to this, uh, this staggering student debt issue. I mean, Catalina is facing a, a worrisome amount of debt, but imagine uh, if you want to go on uh, through college and on to med school and become a primary care physician. We desperately need a lot more primary care physicians right now. Uh, the amount of debt that is involved. So we're going to have to look at the types of public service work that we want people to be able to afford to do. Uh, we want teachers to be able to afford to uh, have a good standard of living and not be crippled with student debt and we want a lot more doctors. I think there are all sorts of places in which we need to look at debt forgiveness as a tool to help folks through this. If I just may say, in the middle class jump start, the Tierney bill, which is John Tierney in the House and uh, Elizabeth Warren in the Senate, this is a bill that will enable kids to refinance their loans. The interest is the killer, especially cumulatively. and. Uh, de uh, Jared mentioned it in his comments, the, uh, the, the, that particular bill. If we could pass that, and, and let me just say this, if it's any source of encouragement to you, across the country, this is a, a big issue. For reasons that Dana said, how can kids leave school and be entrepreneurial, or pursue higher education even, or even get married? Any, any optimistic entrepreneurial thing you might do, you are curtailed. Uh, and the parents of these children who are trying to help their kids and then are trying to help their parents in an atmosphere where several, 24 states, the governors have not extended Medicaid, nursing home, uh, parents in nursing homes at one end, college loans at the other, parents in the middle, economic stability, financial stability, great risk, and we can do something about it. And we can do something. A great, for me, something's bubbling here about, you know, I was, t I was told and taught to um, invest in myself. And so I incurred student loans as well. But 
is there not a greater question here? Because I think the investment is not necessarily a bad thing. It's that when students graduate and they come out into an economy that has no jobs for them, um, you know, where do we, what do we do with that? Um, because if college is the way out, and then once you get out, then the jobs don't exist. Where's the responsibility for, for growing that? Well, for that first uh, piece of the, the three legs of the stool are jobs and growth, uh, invest in education, when women succeed, America succeed. And on the job piece, <laughs> there is something very directly that we can, and in some cases, have done. Uh, right as soon as the president became president, we passed the, uh, uh, the um, uh, Recovery Act, which created or saved three and a half million jobs. Now, again, not enough. We needed to do more. There's been obstruction as to doing more on his agenda, and that's something we have to debate in this election. But once, uh, two very specific things that we say are, right now, under the current regime in the Congress, if you send jobs overseas, you get a tax break for it, and by the way, you can deduct you're sending those jobs overseas from your taxes. So this is ridiculous, right? Yeah. So I mean, our, our initiative says, no, reverse that. Give the tax break to the company that is keeping jobs in America. Good right. paying jobs in America. A, B, build, as, as Jared said, build the infrastructure of America. And that means women in non-traditional jobs as well as men building. We have trillions of dollars of deficit of bridges and roads and, uh, roads and uh, mass transit and uh, water projects and broadband and for infrastructure for the future. They're, these are jobs immediately to build the infrastructure. Our formula calls for uh, uh, Build America bonds paid for by closing tax loopholes for special interests like <laughs> subsidies to pay for it. So doesn't it, none of this increases the deficit. This is all about that. And then uh, we also have one other one in there that I, you may be interested in because it addresses the income uh, inequality, the disparity in income. And it says, it says, if you're a company and you want to pay your CEO more than a million dollars a year, you can do so but the taxpayer is not going to subsidize it. You're not getting a tax deduction for that. And if you want to, you can do qualify for something more by giving a raise to your employees who have made the success of your company possible. So that's about this You're absolutely right, Dana. We have to be, we have a moral imperative to create jobs, good paying jobs, but well-paid jobs too. And that's why lifting the minimum wage not only helps those families, but that money, if you're making the minimum wage, you're gonna spend it right away, right on necessities. You inject demand into the economy, creating other jobs. So the minimum wage increase is a big stimulus to the economy in addition to being an assistance uh, to those families. Common sense governance, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Who needs it? Who needs it? Um, Leader Pelosi, you mentioned the Pell Grants and that your colleagues, you call them, we'll call them Republicans, want to freeze the Pell Grants for 10 years. The question from Larry Hirschman is, what are the prospects for redirecting Pell Grants away from poor performing, for-profit colleges to public universities, including community colleges? Really good. I like hearing it. <laughs> you may not have noticed. You may not have noticed, but when we passed the Affordable Care Act, which again addresses the uh, economic security of America's families, the financial security of their families, when we passed that, at the very exact same time, there was a there was one bill that had two provisions. One was the Affordable Care Act. The other one was the Higher Education Bill, and it had uh, three parts. Well, at least three parts. One of them was the heaviest investment we could make in community colleges, recognizing the important role that community colleges play in, in uh, our economy and 
in the lives, most importantly, of American people. Uh, the second piece was Pell Grants, to increase the, the number of Pell Grants, the overall number, as well as increase the amount from $4,000 to over $5,000 in the Pell Grant. And the third point was uh, to reduce the, at that time we were cutting in half the, student, the interest on the Stafford loans, the, the college loans. Now we want to take it down even further to the market where the interest rates are. But, but that is, um, so the Pell Grant was really an important part of that. And wherever it is used, whether it's in a community college, whether it's a for-profit institution or not, uh, we have to make sure that those Pell Grants are used very well and that we have to subject all elements of users of Pell Grants to that scrutiny. Uh, in some cases, you see the for-profits, uh, some for-profits have abused that, and so we have, to, we have to look into that because, first of all, it's about the education of that person, and it's about taxpayer dollars that we do not want to be squandered. But this Pell Grant thing, I want to tell you this story. I promise you won't tell anybody. <laughs> we were having this debate three years ago, right about now, in Washington on the budget. And we had to find $200 billion of cuts so that we, that we would then agree on where we go from here. And President Obama was agreeing to these proposals that the Republicans were putting forth. And they were kept walking. They, they put it out there, then they'd walk away. But anyway, that's not here, neither here nor there. The, my point is the following. I said to them, we could save $38 billion if we cut the subsidies to big oil. Big oil makes, gets $38 billion in subsidies as an incentive to drill for a period of time in which they will profit a trillion dollars. They do not need the $38 billion as an incentive. They have a trillion dollar, at least, incentive. So I said to the Republicans, let's take this $38 billion, that's a good chunk toward our $200 billion. And they said, almost with one voice, the leadership. Why would we do that? Why would we do that when you can save the same amount of money by cutting $38 billion out of Pell Grants? So that is the challenge that Jared Hoffman has on the budget committee. <laughs> I certainly agree with everything uh, that was just said, and we have that uh, that accountability uh, role that we need to play for Pell Grants. I think the broader student debt picture also comes into play though, and I think we need to do much more uh, for these largely private institutions that have figured out a business model that depends on bringing folks through uh, their system, racking up lots of debt to pay their tuition, and then turning them loose without very good success. And President Obama, I think, deserves a lot of credit for beginning to propose some uh, some real meaningful ways to address this, including something that's a little controversial, I suppose, but uh, a ranking system, some transparency and accountability, and, and a way to inform students so they can look when they, uh, you know, get these uh, brochures from from these companies that run these colleges. Uh, you know, how many folks actually, after after getting their grants and their loans, uh, found jobs, uh, and we can begin to make more informed choices uh, for our students as well. <laughs> I just want to bring the importance of Pell Grants home here at the College of Marin. You know, each year we administer about $13.5 million in aid to students, and about $6.4 million of that is Pell Grants. So it's over, over half of what we actually administer in, in financial aid here. This question is from Sally Matsuishi. Here in Marin County, according to the UC Accord, we have one of the largest educational equity gaps in the state. To what extent do you believe this is a function of educational racism, funding, or poor leadership? What do you think is the best way to close this gap? <laughs> I get my names on that question. Um, I think actually probably a combination of all three things. Uh, I think that Mer in this community, there are people that don't recognize that people that are different contribute something different to the society. 
We found at Davidson Middle School, where we were in program improvement year six, seven years ago, that when we put students together, all students together in heterogeneously grouped group classes, so kids of all ability levels, all ethnicities, that every student in the school test scores rose. And so what we found was when you put a group of diverse kids together, everyone grows. So we had an 86 point gain on the academic performance index in California, and we also reduced student suspensions by 86%, so that we kept students in school. And it was all about recognizing that we all bring something to the table, and that we all have something to offer. And it took a lot of us to learn how to be allies for people that are not like ourselves. So I think that there is issues around race and ethnicity, but poverty plays a bigger piece. Poverty is a much larger piece than a person's ethnicity. And it's poverty that is what we find to be uh, the most detrimental to children's education. And I think that the leadership in the community is continuing to try and bring people together, but it goes back to maybe what happens in the house of, I'm not gonna talk to you right now, and I'll let you know when I am. Um, and so I think that happens in our community as well. Talking about modeling behavior. Someone else here to join in? Please. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, this question from Ellis Reed, I, I think, is, is vital. And I want to um, piggyback it with something that Mr. Ray has said as well, so I'm going to add to it. As we speak, Ferguson, Missouri is under a state of emergency in its ninth day of civil unrest. Michael Brown was to start college in a few weeks. As educators, do we need to teach our young men of color how to walk in this world safely as much as we teach them how to access college? And further to the point, we have a crisis on our border with Mexico, and we have young students here who are fearful of progressing academically because they're not Americans, American citizens. How do we do this thing that we need to do? I would start by saying we absolutely have an obligation to have these conversations with our students, and I'm confident that many of our faculty are in fact having these conversations with our students in our classes. But we have an obligation as an educational institution to bring the community together like we are today, to have forums and conversations, to, to better understand um, the issues at hand, and certainly better understand how we can ultimately have a positive impact on our students so that they're more informed and better aware and better equipped to deal with the society that we're preparing them for. Dana, I would just say I hope our response to these situations is not that we need to teach young black men how to walk down the street. That's not the response that's needed. Uh, but clearly, um, there's a wake-up call that tells us we're nowhere close to a post-racial America. And we have an ongoing challenge of teaching police and others uh, how to do a better job uh, of uh, working with communities, of responding to specific circumstances and um, there's just a lot of racism and racial tension still left in this country, not just in Ferguson, Missouri, but in Washington, D.C. too. I'll tell you, the politics that we see, the kind of vitriol and uh, personal animus that we have seen uh, presented to this president of the United States is unlike anything I think any of us could have imagined when he was sworn in uh, in January of 2009. So we've got a lot of work to do. I agree with the president. Thank you, Jared, and, and thank you, President Kuhn. Uh, on this subject of the border, uh, they have spoken so beautifully about Ferguson. Uh, I guess one of my biggest problems with Ferguson, and I've been on the phone with my colleagues, my, uh, our colleague from there, um, Clay, uh, Lacey Clay, he, he's African-American. His father was in kind of that long tradition of civil rights, all of that, and Emmanuel Cleaver, Cleaver, who's from Missouri, who's a reverend, who was also in Congress, and they were giving us their account of what was happening there. But it was also a, something that, that um, they didn't want the outside to exploit. They wanted to find justice. They wanted to find justice, and there's the people are coming here, agitators, anarchists, and the rest, doing Molotov cocktails. That's not what's coming out of our community. So let us 
make our own peace here. As far as the police were concerned, whatever the circumstances were, they were unfortunate. But to leave Michael Brown there for four hours, a human being unattended, is something so under, I just don't even understand that. But I want to go to the border, um, and that's why I was late, because I was on the phone on the subject of uh, Ferguson. Uh, it's, it's a very big deal. The president spoke to, today, once again, very beautifully on the subject. But on the subject of, of the border, and the dreamers, many of whom may be in your school, your school or their members of their family, uh, the last two bills that we passed in the Congress of the United States ignored the comprehensive immigration reform that passed the Senate in a bipartisan way that Congressman Hoffman referenced, but instead passed two really destructive pieces of legislation. We'd have extended the hand of friendship to the Speaker to say, let's, let's find a path. We know it'll have to be a compromise. Let's find a path. He said they went further to the right. And don't take my word for it. The National Catholic Conference of Bishops said that the legislation that they passed that day on the floor dishonored America. That's how bad the legislation was. Overturning uh, the president's initiatives on the DREAM Act, uh, putting up barriers to the president doing anything. It, it, they had a bill, it was terrible. We said, come our way and we can have a compromise. Instead, they went the other way and they dishonored America. So there, there's a, you know, I'm not painting everyone with the same brush, but the fact is that the, the way it is happening in Washington, D.C. is not a way that any Republican that I know would take pride in. This is really something that, how can we, how can they talk about all their religious fervor and how they respect the dignity and worth of every person, spark of divinity that exists in every one of us, including themselves, hopefully, and, and treat people in a way that is almost subhuman. It really is a remarkable thing. And that's why what Michael, uh, the superintendent was saying about um, respecting other views is so important because it's not that, as we talk about women in the workplace, that women are better than men or one of us is better than that. It's that the beauty is in the mix and that's where you get the best result and the most legitimate Result. So, on, in terms of Ferguson, or in terms of of the border, if we just all remember what we profess, and that is that every person uh, has value, perhaps we could come out with a uh, a better result. But we have plenty of work to do in that regard. And I hasten to add, Republicans and Democrats in the Senate passed the bill, the good bill. That's not great, but <laughs> the better bill. But in the House. It just went to a really, a, well, the bishops. It dishonors America. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a lot of work to do, and obviously our representatives in the House and Senate need your help. Our leaders have come before you today, but you are leaders as well in your communities, in your neighborhoods. We need to pass legislation that moves forward the middle class, that makes education affordable, that gives honor to all people who live in this country. Thank you so much for coming. Your questions will all be answered by Congressman Hoffman's staff. I want you to know that. And if you have any more, they've offered that. <laughs> I'm not making it up. Um, and if you have any more, please, um, Please distribute them to uh, a member of Congressman Huffman's staff. I'd like to thank our guest today, Catalea Sankham. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lance Reyes, off the cow. Dr. Mike Wattenpah. <laughs> President David Wayne Coon. <laughs> Representative Jared Huffman. <laughs> and our very empathetic and compassionate leader, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you so much.
and our moderator, Dana Kim. Yeah.